A lot of people today, they don't think about it. They say, oh, they're putting a man on the moon. Or, oh, they're setting up another space shuttle. But you see, they don't realize that in the early days of the space program, NASA was whites only. This was, uh, when was it? 1957, 58. It was a different time, you understand. See, in 1957, if you were black, and if you were an astronaut, you were out of work. They had names like Loopy Louie Hayes, Suitcase Jefferson, and Rocket Randall. What they lacked in technical know-how, they more than made up for in courage and zeal. The courageous heroes of the old Negro space program. Oh, it started like any old thing, I suppose. It started over a girl. I was over at this little juke joint where we used to hang out at. And I was making time with this cute little thing, cute little stuck-up thing named Alita Monroe, who I later on married. She told me she couldn't be with a man who didn't have no job. So I called up my best friend, Louis Hayes. I said, Louis, where can a Negro get a job? It was a different time, you understand, 1957, 58. So Louis said he heard that they were forming a new government agency. So the both of us went down to NASA. But to our surprise, they weren't hiring any Negroes at NASA. It was a different time, you understand. It was a different time, 1957 or 58. America's love affair with racism was in full swing. NASA was no exception. What we see recurring, or reoccurring, if I may, in this story, or tale, if you will, is the insistence, or the assertion on the part of NASA that it never happened. Which I think is a very roundabout way of denying or negating something if that is indeed your intention or your intent. We was young and we didn't know nothing, but we wasn't going to let nobody tell us we couldn't do it. So we put together our own gig, got ourselves some uniforms, and I told Alita Monroe that I was working for NASA, we are the Negro American Space Society of Astronauts. Got laid that very night. The uniforms were stitched by hand. The rockets cobbled together from NASA's discards. Word spread quickly. By the summer of 1960, NASA had over 240 black astronauts. White NASA was beginning to take notice. Kennedy was aware of the Negro space program and very much against it, uh, his stance on civil rights notwithstanding. One can only imagine, as, as terrified as the administration was, 
of losing the space race to the Russians, they were ten times more terrified of losing it to the Negroes. As Washington fumed, Harlem celebrated. The ragtag group of black astronauts were becoming minor celebrities, traveling from town to town, staging launches to raise money, endorsing local businesses, their exploits glorified in song. Oh, there goes Loopy Louie. Where's he going, friend? If I know Loopy Louie, he's shooting up again. Is that right? He's shooting up again. Don't tell me. He's shooting up again. Oh shit. For a time, it seemed the Negro space program could do no wrong. But there were casualties. With their cloth spacesuits and their makeshift rockets, black astronauts faced far greater hardships than their white counterparts. A week into his first orbital mission, Sullivan Carew rode home to his wife in Smithfield. Dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that I shall attempt re-entry tomorrow. And lest I shall not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write a few lines, that they may fall under your eye when I am no more. It sure is fucking cold up here. Yes, sir. I about froze my motherfucking nuts off. God damn, space is one cold motherfucker. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you with mighty cables that only omnipotence can break. But shit, woman, it is cold as fuck up here. Sullivan Carew died two days later upon re-entry. Even so, casualties did not slow down black NASA as they did white NASA. Here we have a tale of two very different cultures or cultural settings, if I may. For example, when the Apollo 1 astronauts blew up on the launch pad, there was an investigation and a congressional hearing and so on and so forth. Uh, by contrast, when the Negro astronaut Peter Stinky Pete Carver caught fire in a church parking lot in Elgin, Illinois, they just casually extinguished him and he was ready for another launch the next morning. Before long, Washington had had enough, but the Negro space program was not easily shut down. At this point, or juncture, NASA goes ahead and poaches some of the lighter-skinned black astronauts, and to a certain extent this worked quite well. Uh, Gordon Cooper, Buzz Aldrin could pass for white. And, of course, the final blow, the coup de grace, if I may, was the so-called black blackout, in which Washington surreptitiously prevents the media from discussing the accomplishments of the black astronauts and instead encourages them to spread rumors of riots and civil unrest. In fact, much of the news we read in those days was all part of a well-orchestrated diversion or misdirection, if you will. The lesson here, I think, is that people believe what they want to believe. The final blow to the Negro space program came ironically at its finest hour. September 31st, 1966. A full three years before Neil Armstrong. Jefferson and Hayes land their modified Cadillac Coupe de Ville just east of the Sea of Tranquility. But because of the black blackout, the accomplishment is completely buried by the mainstream media. Well, we expected to be heroes, but when we got back, we were just Negroes. Dejected and discouraged, NASA officially disbanded. But its heroes live on, for the few who care to learn their story. Truth shall make us free. Truth shall make us free. Truth 
shall make us free.